Welcome to What the Paper Said, in which I, Patrick Crozier, skim through the times from a hundred years ago, read some of the articles, and comment on the ones I find interesting. In this episode, the week ending the 15th of October 1922, Britain sees the back of its last Liberal Prime Minister, Sir Almeric Fitzroy faces justice, the BBC, or at least a BBC, comes into being, and a certain Herr Hitler makes an appearance. But the big story of the week is that David Lloyd George has resigned as Prime Minister. A bit of background here. In 1915, in the wake of the Shell scandal, the Liberals were forced to go into coalition with the Conservatives. A year later, Lloyd George became Prime Minister, unseating Herbert Asquith. The Liberal Party then split. At the 1918 general election, the coalition fought as a coalition. The Asquithian Liberals were almost wiped out, with Asquith himself losing his seat. Now, with an election looming, a lot of Conservatives are wondering if the coalition with Lloyd George at its head is really such a good idea. This is from Friday 20th of October 1922. Fall of the Coalition. Mr Lloyd George resigns. The King summons Mr Law. Early election expected. The coalition is broken. The Prime Minister has resigned office. Mr Law has been asked by the King to form a ministry and is understood to be reserving his reply pending the selection of a new leader by the Unionist Party. As anticipated in the Times yesterday, events have moved swiftly. When the Unionist members of Parliament gathered in the morning at the Carlton Club, their temper was found to be very unfavourable to Mr Chamberlain, the Coalition and the Prime Minister. The Chamberlain in question is Austin Chamberlain, son of Joseph, brother of Neville, who you may have heard of, and as of that morning, if not that evening, leader of the Conservative Party. The unexpected result of the by-election at Newport strengthened their desire for independence. Um, the by-election in question took place on Wednesday, yes, Wednesday, and resulted in a win for an anti-coalition Conservative. It goes on. After some debate, a resolution affirming that the Conservative Party should fight the election independently, with its own leader and its own programme, was carried by 187 votes to 87. Mr Chamberlain and Lord Balfour opposed the resolution. The decisive speech was made by Mr Law, who urged that the adoption of any other course than that recommended by the resolution would split the party irremediably. This is all a bit odd. I'm, I'm trying to think of the last time rival political parties fought a general election as a coalition as opposed to governing as a coalition after an election. I suppose it would have to be the Liberal SDP alliance in the 1980s, not that they ever got to govern, of course. It goes on. Mr Stanley Baldwin, Sir Arthur Griffith Boscawen and other members of the government who supported the resolution immediately tendered their resignations to the Prime Minister. The resignations of Lord Balfour, Mr Austin Chamberlain and other coalition unionist members followed. Early in the afternoon the Prime Minister went to Buckingham Palace and placed the resignation of the government in the hands of the King. Mr Bonalore was then summoned to the palace. In response to His Majesty's request that he should form a new government, Mr Bonalore is understood to have submitted that he was not leader of the Unionist Party and that until the party had chosen a new leader, he could not accept a mandate to form a ministry. It is probable that a meeting of leading Conservatives will today express to Mr Bonalore their desire to recommend him to a party meeting for election to the Unionist leadership. Should Mr Bonalore accept this recommendation, a party meeting would be convened as soon as possible to carry it into effect. This may not be before tomorrow. In Unionist Party circles, it is generally accepted as a foregone conclusion that Mr Bonalore will become Prime Minister and will form his administration within a very few days. So a Liberal Prime Minister has left office and we haven't had one since. The Times had this to say in an editorial. This is from Friday the 20th. A new chapter. There is cause for national satisfaction at the course and consequences of yesterday's meeting of Unionist members of Parliament at the Carlton Club. Should there be surprise in any quarters, it can only be because those quarters were out of touch with public feeling and failed to appreciate the strength of the national desire for a return to straightforward politics and sincere government. So what was Lloyd George's psychic Winston Churchill doing during all of this? This is from Thursday the 10th of October. It was announced late last night that Mr Winston Churchill was successfully operated upon during the evening for appendicitis and was doing very well. 
Mr. Churchill was taken ill early on Monday morning. He had given a dinner party the night before to the Prime Minister and other ministers and friends. Convenient. Not that it matters much. Um, Churchill may be a rather bombastic character with the gift of the gab, but he has had a rather indifferent ministerial career and is a member of a Liberal Party that is in deep trouble. Talking of trouble, last week I covered the case of Sir Almerick Fitzroy, who had been accused, I kid you not, of interfering with and annoying persons in Hyde Park. This week we had the hearing. This is from Monday the 16th of October. Sir Almerick Fitzroy, clerk to the Privy Council of Lower Belgrave Street SW, was charged on remand at Marlborough Street and Police Court on Saturday with willfully interfering with and annoying persons using Hyde Park on the night of September the 29th. Um, note how quickly they did things in those days. I'll go on. The magistrate, Mr Mead, said there were two instances out of the four alleged by the prosecution in which women were proved to have been annoyed and imposed a fine of five pounds and ten guineas costs. Notice of appeal was given. Why fines are in pounds and costs in guineas, that is, a pound and a shilling, is anyone's guess. All this sounds bad for Sir Almerick, and it is certainly expensive, but the hearing itself went rather well for him. His counsel shredded the credibility of one of the witnesses, and that will be the basis of the appeal. It goes on. Sir H. Curtis Bennett, addressing the magistrate for the defence, urged that this was a class of charge that was very easily made and was very difficult to deal with. Numbers of men had been convicted under these regulations upon the evidence of police officers that a woman appeared annoyed. In his closing remarks, the magistrate said this. The defendant admitted that he sat down beside a lady and entered into conversation with her. If she was a modest, respectable woman, that conduct might annoy her, and any gentleman would know that it might annoy. <laughs> the fiend. Another thing that might annoy a modest, respectable woman is the prospect of one of her favourite ships of the line being scrapped. As I mentioned in the 8th of October episode, Britain is under a treaty obligation to scrap HMS Lion. But wait! This is from Friday the 20th of October. HMS Lion respited. It is announced by the Saturday Review that HMS Lion has been withdrawn from the Admiralty Disposal List. We believe, it is stated, that we are right in supposing that the Admiralty in its capacity as guardian of our great naval traditions has very wisely and properly decided that at least some further consideration should be given to the question of the lion's preservation. In doing so, and thereby cancelling the effect of the hasty and ill-informed semi-official communique which was issued on the subject, this is the one I was talking about, the Board of Admiralty has acted with the intelligence and common sense which we have a right to look for but do not always discover in the actions of great departments of state. Thank goodness we don't have to worry about that anymore. But isn't it great? A dreadnought is being saved for the nation. Future generations will be able to stand by the same guns, climb the same steps, look out of the same bridge as the men who fought the greatest naval battle ever. Or maybe not. One thing that isn't being scrapped now that the war is over is income tax. This is from Mr Arthur J Wilson of 154 Clerkenwell Road, EC, on Monday the 16th of October. Politicians appear to have forgotten that the income tax was and should be essentially a war tax. With this tax at five shillings in the pound, that's about 25%, well, it's exactly 25% as it happens, the government has nothing up its sleeve in event of hostilities breaking out. With income tax reduced to its Gladstonian level, the government would always know exactly how much it could collect in an ensuing year by increasing the rate from, say, peacetime one shilling to wartime five shillings. Not sure about his understanding of economics here, but then the Laffer curve had yet to be invented. Still, there is a point about having something put away, or at least available, for a rainy day. Just as well we're so much more sensible these days. Another target for the grasping taxman is the motorist. This is from Thursday the 19th of October. The Ministry of Transport issued last night figures of the number of motor etc. licences issued from December the 1st, 1921 to August the 31st, 1922, together with the tax collected in that period in Great Britain as returned by local authorities. The total number of motor vehicles in respect of which licences were current on August the 31st is given approximately as 962,000, including 314,000 cars taxed on horsepower, 
it doesn't say what happens to the ones that aren't taxed on horsepower, but that's by the by. 377,000 cycles, I'm pretty sure they mean motorbikes, 150,000 commercial goods vehicles, and 77,000 motor hackneys. I assume they mean cabs here. The average receipt for a whole year licence was £17.12 shillings for cars taxed on horsepower, £2.13 shillings six pence for cycles, £21.13 shillings for commercial goods vehicles, and £23.19 shillings for motor hackneys. I, uh, I wince when the DVLA charges me £250, but the Ministry of Transport is charging rather more than three ounces of gold for having a car or about £4,500 based on the last time I looked at the price of gold. I'm sure the British motor industry just loves that. Another statistic that uh, caught my eye was from a report on Monday the 16th of October of a speech by ex-Prime Minister Herbert Asquith. Mr Asquith on Saturday addressed a meeting of about 3,000 Liberals in the Picture House, West Hartlepool. I have nothing to say about the speech. But when I, it's the number that's interesting. When I first read that number, I thought, wow, that's a lot. More perhaps than any modern day party leader might get at a party conference. But then I thought, hang about. These things are nowadays televised and are probably going to audiences in the millions. Talking of broadcasting. This is from the uh, Thursday the 19th of October. It should only be a matter of days before broadcasting by wireless telephony commences in London. The Memorandum and Articles of Association of the British Broadcasting Company that sounds familiar couldn't by any chance be related to have now been agreed and yesterday they were ratified by a full meeting of manufacturers held at the Institution of Electrical Engineers London. The British Broadcasting Company would, in the words of the Memorandum, be a public utility service for the broadcasting of news, information, concerts, lectures, educational matter, speeches, weather reports and theatrical entertainments. Not quite sure where Jimmy Savile fits into all this, but it goes on. Every member undertook that the apparatus he sold except batteries, accumulators and aerial equipment was made in this country. The licence to be issued by the Postmaster General to the public would cost 10 shillings, half of which would go to the post office and half to the British Broadcasting Company. Some explanation isn't required here. The BBC will be funded partly by receipts from the sales of radio sets made by its shareholders and partly by the licence fee. Nobody other than the shareholders is allowed to sell a radio set. Foreign manufacturers, uh, for reasons that I don't entirely understand, possibly protectionism, possibly the fear of foreign influence peddling, are not allowed to participate. Spoiler alert, this didn't work. It goes on. The committee were fully alive to the necessity of having good programmes and recognised that it was only by doing so that the success of the scheme would be assured. Doubts were expressed as to whether the public could be protected against illicit sets and on this point Mr Godfrey Isaacs, he's from Marconi, said it should be made quite clear to the public that in their own interests and for their own protection unless the official BBC mark was on an instrument, they should not buy it, because, as everyone knows, foreign electrical equipment is liable to explode at any time. I suspect that the idea of state broadcasting may get taken up by others. This slot, for instance. This is from Wednesday, the 18th of October. German fascists. According to an Augsburg message, the nationalist socialists of Bavaria are emulating the Italian fascisti. Under the command of a Herr Hitler, an armed body of some 180 men recently bivouacked in Rosenheim and travelled in lorries to Alak, where there was a trouble between them and some workmen. I suspect there's a bit more to this. Herr Hitler's agents are stated to be purchasing quantities of arms throughout the Bavarian Oberland. I'm sure there's a perfectly innocent explanation. Uh, by the way, to the best of my knowledge, this is Hitler's first appearance in the pages of the Times. Anyway, that's all for this week. I aim to have something up next week, but I promise nothing.